Hey friends, it's Mike. It's Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. I had an opportunity to sit down and watch episode two of Peter Jackson's Get Back, and I'll get right into it. So episode two is three hours in length, so it's long. And it picks up where episode one leaves off, where George leaves the band. And we're told there is an initial meeting to bring him back, but that did not resolve the situation. And there are concerns about completing the Get Back project as well as the future of the band without George being there. So on January 13th, Billy, John, Ringo, and the entourage involved in the sessions discuss the situation with George not being there. And then Billy makes an odd comment that almost sounds like predictive programming. He says that in 50 years, they will say the Beatles broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. And then as they're sitting there, there's this awkward moment where there is this silence. And I mean like dead silence. And Billy starts whistling. And nobody's saying anything. It's just dead silence and <laughs> Billy whistling. It was very odd and very strange. And then there's a scene where John and Billy are having a discussion and the conversation is being recorded with a quote hidden microphone and during that conversation John tells Billy that he Billy can be overbearing and both of them are not fair to George and then you'll see the yellow star again so this is a call out that I thought that the conversation or the dialogue has significance with regard to the McCartney and Beatles conspiracy. So as the conversation continues, they discuss the shift in band leadership from John to Billy. Billy tells John that the others, meaning George and Ringo, view him, meaning John, as the leader and Billy is the number two guy. Now the reason why this conversation is important is because as we are told in memoirs, and as I have discussed in my own research on the McCartney and Beatles conspiracy, one of the demands that Billy made before accepting the role of Paul McCartney was that going forward, he would be the leader of the band. He would be calling the shots. He would determine the direction that the band would take. and. During this conversation, this is what they are talking about. They're talking about that transition moving from John to Billy. Now, I also want to mention that John does not appear to be under the influence of anything throughout episode two, and I didn't think he was under the influence of anything in episode one either. Certainly not a heroin addiction. I did not pick up on that. In episode two in particular, he's very coherent and he's very animated. Then they try to connect with George to get him to come back to the band, but they find out that he left town. He went to Liverpool for a few days to get away and to clear his head. And then they decide to move the live shows out a week. Originally, they were scheduled for January 19th and January 20th. Now remember, the Beatles came into the studio on January 2nd. And because things were not going well, lots of delays, poor planning, they moved the shows out to January 26th and the 27th, so a week out. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Slide number three. All right, so then we have a scene where Peter Sellers drops in, and then we have some more peculiar dialogue, and that's why we have the yellow star there. And in this particular scene, there's dialogue mostly between Billy and John. And you have to listen closely. And if you're not familiar with the Paul is Dead conspiracy, then this probably went right over your head. But Billy, out of nowhere, mentions the number nine. Then John starts to recite the lyrics from yesterday. <laughs> and then Billy says something about Canyons of the Mind, which is a bonzo song 
which points back to Vivian Stanshall. So in this scene, it doesn't last very long. We have the number nine, which is a Paul is Dead clue. We have the song Yesterday. Again, John is reciting the lyrics. Yesterday is Biological Paul's epitaph. And then there is a Bonzo's reference where Billy played Vivian Stanshall. Now remember back in episode one, five minutes in to the documentary, Peter inserted the film frame from Yellow Submarine where there are two Pauls. So the documentary is dropping Paul is Dead Clues. Then on January 15th, they patch things up with George. The TV special is abandoned. And then they head to Apple Studios, which means they move out of Twickenham. On January 16th, they move the instruments and the equipment to Apple. Now, if we go back to the show I did with Paul Jansen on the Get Back documentary, one of the things that we discussed is whether the Beatles had to lug equipment from Twickenham to Apple when they relocated, or did each studio have its own set of equipment? And the answer is no. They had to move stuff from Twickenham to Apple. In fact, in episode one, we find out that Twickenham was completely barren. It was a big, giant warehouse. It didn't even have any recording equipment. And also in episode two, we see a piano tuner tuning up the piano. And that is something that I said in the show with Paul, that if they did move the piano, time would have to be taken to retune the piano because it was moved. Anytime you move a piano, you have to retune it, or you should retune it. And so when they get to Apple, they find out that the setup is a problem. They are finding that there are unacceptable levels of noise and hiss. And this is because they had delegated this work to a guy with a nickname of Magic Alex. And this is a nickname that John Lennon gave Yanni Alexis Mardas. And Magic Alex worked for Apple in their electronics division. But there was no magic going on that day when they got to Apple. So they sent out an SOS to George Martin. And on January 17th, George Martin sends equipment to Apple Studios. He sends two four-track machines that will feed into an eight-track recorder. And the eight-track recorder belongs to George Harrison. It's the same eight-track recorder that they brought in to Twickenham when they were building the makeshift recording studio. So a couple days goes by, and now it's January 20th, and Apple is still not ready. On January 21st, George Harrison returns, and they are still experiencing some delays with the setup in the studio, and the sound engineer, Glenn Johns, is working to fix the problems. Then we have footage of a lot of goofing around, and the film, quite frankly, drags at this point. And then we finally hear a complete version of a song, and that song is Dig a Pony. Throughout episode one, up until this point in episode two, we are just getting snippets of songs. Also, I want to point out that within the Paul is Dead community, there is discussion and debate about whether the guy that's playing Paul McCartney during the Get Back sessions is Billy, or is it another person playing the part of Paul McCartney, or some think it's biological Paul who came back from the dead to join the band for Let It Be. As I was watching episode one and two, I was paying a lot of attention to the way Billy spoke, his facial expressions, and also his body movements. And I concluded that we are indeed watching Billy during the Get Back sessions. All right, let's move to slide number four. So on January 22nd, they select Primrose Hill for the live performance. So they're still talking about doing this live performance. And Primrose Hill is a public park located north of Regent's Park in London, England. And then we see the Beatles again rehearsing 
Dig a Pony and I've Got a Feeling. And then another yellow star. Billy Preston arrives, and this is a pivotal moment because it represents a major shift in the dynamics of the sessions. We are told that Billy Preston just dropped in to visit, but when we watch the documentary, you'll know that a Fender Rhodes piano was delivered right before he arrives. So I was questioning whether Billy just popped in or was Billy asked to come in and join the sessions. And once Billy starts playing, he pumps life into the sessions and things pick up considerably. Then on January 23rd, we have more footage of Yoko, quote, singing, and we hear the Beatles rehearsing, Oh Darling, and Get Back. And then on January 24th, the songs are sounding better and they're coming together. And this is in big part because of Billy Preston, and there is talk amongst the Beatles about Preston possibly joining the band as the fifth Beatle. And then also I want to note throughout episode one and episode two, Mal Evans is doing gopher work. And I actually felt bad for Mal. Mal, write this down. Mal, go get this. Mal, go do that. I really felt for him. Then on January 25th, there is Footage of Billy and John discussing their trip to India. It is a very long and boring segment that could have been edited down significantly or completely left out of the documentary. I really didn't see what the purpose was. And then there's discussion about whether they're still doing 14 songs and when are they wrapping up. So there's a bit of confusion about what the next steps are. So now there's questions about where exactly are they at? with the original objective. And up to this point, there's four songs that they are really majoring on. I've Got a Feeling, Don't Let Me Down, Two of Us, and Dig a Pony. So they came in on January 2nd, it's January 25th, and those four songs they're really focusing on. They played other songs, snippets of this, rehearsed a bit of that, a bit of this, but those four appeared to be what they were building around. And then on the 25th, they record for you Blue, and it's a very good take of the song. In fact, the film tells us that this is the album version of the song. However, George Harrison came in a year later, in January of 1970, to redo his vocals. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so let's go to Slide number five. And then they find out that, for whatever reason, I wasn't sure why, Primrose was not going to happen. So that location for the live show is off the table. And then I have three yellow stars here. So the first one is a comment that George made that I found to be very intriguing. George says, quote, This is the most I ever played by playing every day. So I thought, what is he implying? Is he saying that he didn't play much in general? Or is he saying that he didn't play this much in other recording sessions? Now, when you go back and you read articles about George, what you'll find is that he was not prolific at practicing his guitar. In fact, he can go for long periods of time and never pick it up. Now, I covered this before. But George pretty much put the guitar down when he was learning to play the sitar. And by his own admission, this hurt his guitar playing, especially his lead guitar playing skills. And going back to episode one, he talks about the fact that his guitar skills are not extraordinary. And he also talks about the fact that he's not Eric Clapton from a playing perspective. In other words, he doesn't have Clapton's skills. And to be honest, not many guitar players do. So we'll cut uh, George a little slack there. Then another interesting comment is made in the studio, and this comes from the sound engineer, Glenn Johns. And he says, quote, playing live 
in one room is a fresh thing for the Beatles. So I paused the documentary at this point. I went back and played it again. Playing live in one room is a fresh thing for the Beatles. So I thought, what is Glenn saying? Was he saying that the Beatles, as a band, were not a cohesive unit that were operating together? In other words, when they recorded Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, that Billy, as an example, would come in, lay down the basic rhythm track, and then at a later date, John would come in or George would come in and then they would record their tracks. In other words, they weren't coming in together. They weren't four guys sitting in the studio like we're seeing with the Get Back sessions. In fact, there's an interview, and I played this in a presentation going back a while ago, where Billy explains that George Harrison was essentially a no-show for the Sergeant Pepper sessions. And Billy did a lot of the guitar work himself on the Sgt. Pepper tracks. So if I had to read into what Glenn Johns is saying, I think that that is what he is saying, that it's been a long time since they operated as a band, as a unit together. And that the Get Back sessions were designed by Billy to bring the band back together. It was an attempt to make them a whole unit once again. But as we know, through history, that didn't happen. So again, Glenn John saying playing live in one room is a fresh thing for the Beatles was a very, very interesting comment that made me pause and think about what was implied in that statement. And then a conversation comes up about shifting the film to a theatric release. In other words, it's going to be a movie that's going to play in theaters. And Billy says, well, the film is being shot in 16 millimeter and that's for TV. Movies are 35 millimeter. And Billy is asking whether there's going to be a quality issue by blowing the film up from 16 millimeter to 35 millimeter for theatric release. And somebody in the room, maybe it was Michael Lindsay Hogg, said, no, there's not going to be any problem, when in fact there was a problem. That's why the original film, going back to 1970, was very grainy. It's because they blew it up from 16 millimeter to 35 millimeter. So Billy was onto something. And then there's a scene where Michael Lindsay Hogg and Glenn Johns propose the rooftop concert to Billy. It's another example of Billy being in charge. Proposals and ideas go through him, and then he decides yay or nay. They make their way up to the top of the roof. They get the lay of the land, and there are concerns about whether the roof can support the band, equipment, and crew. This is something that Paul Jansen and I discussed in the show that we did together when. Paul took a look at Peter's promos. He pointed out that the top of the Apple building had planks and flooring installed. And this was done to ensure that the building could hold the load of the band, the equipment, and the entourage. And I had said in that show that in all likelihood, they had to call in a structural engineer to make sure that whatever support they put up there, if they were able to do it, was done in a proper way. This part of the film dispels the belief by many Beatle fans that the Beatles' decision to play on the roof was something that was spur of the moment and spontaneous. In other words, the Beatles just said, hey, I've got an idea, let's go up to the roof and play when in fact it was a late-in-the-game consideration in order to salvage the objective of playing live. That's really what it was at the end of the day. Now if I move to my next note, and you see I have another star here, 
I thought this was a very significant piece of dialogue in the documentary. So to set the scene, they're in the studio and you can tell that they're feeling upbeat about the progress they're making, in big part because of Billy Preston, as I mentioned earlier. But as this discussion is happening, Billy is sitting in his chair with his bass and he appears subdued. So someone in the room asks him what his thoughts are. And then Billy says he's wondering what's next after they complete this project. In other words, Billy is looking to the future. And as he talks about this, he gets no response or positive feedback from the others, John, George, or Ringo. And this came across to me as a very awkward moment for Billy because the no response from the other three was very telling. They were not interested in anything other than completing the task at hand, which was the get back sessions. And as far as the future goes, I don't think so. So this moment in the film, for me, represented another indicator of the band's demise. Regardless of the happy face that Peter's documentary wants to put on this period in Beatle history, this scene pulls us back to reality. It takes us back to what was really going on. What were the real sentiments between the band members, especially John, George, and Ringo versus Billy? And my takeaway from watching episode one and episode two up through this scene is the relationship that the other three have with Billy is not based upon camaraderie and friendship. It's a business relationship. And the sense that I got from watching this scene is the other three were telling Billy, we are not interested in working with you anymore. We are not interested in being your subordinates. And I think this was a very hard pill for Billy to swallow because he wanted to do the get back sessions because he wanted to bring the band back together as a unit. And he was obviously hoping for a future beyond Let It Be. And with this scene, there was a realization, a shot of reality, that what he was hoping for was not going to happen. Because things were not good during this period for the Beatles. And as I covered in my big presentation on Peter Jackson's film going back a few months ago, things weren't going well. There was a lot of tension. There was a lot of acrimony going back to when Billy first took the reins of the band, late 1966 going into 1967. And these hard feelings went beyond the get back sessions. It went on for years afterward. And to solidify the point I'm making, in September of 1969, eight months after the Get Back Sessions, Lennon informs the band that he's leaving, that he wanted a divorce. And then Billy throws in the towel in April of 1970. So, in my opinion, John and George threw in the towel a long time ago. Ringo would have probably hung on, but without John and George, there is no Beatles. Even when we go back to when George walked out of the Get Back sessions, the film, in my opinion, tries to depict that the others care about George, that they didn't mean to hurt his feelings, and so they wanted to bring him back. 
And I think that that's true for John Lennon. But I don't think that's true for Billy. I sensed Billy wanted George back, not because of friendship. He wanted George back because he wasn't going to be able to get through the get back sessions. And it would screw up the future of the band. So in other words, George was a part of the engine. And you don't have to be friends to be part of the engine. But if you remove a piece of that engine, then your vehicle is not going to run the way it used to run. Because John, Paul, George, and Ringo are a brand. And it would be difficult to go forward with Paul, John, Ringo, and Dave if they brought somebody else in. So I think this dialogue in this scene is very, very important because it cuts through all of the happy talk that's being applied to this documentary. Peter can show whatever he wants to show, but as subtle as this scene was, it cut right through the mix and all of the veneer that is being applied by this documentary to reshape the feel and the thoughts and the understanding of what this period was all about. But in this scene at that moment, it became very clear to me what was going on. It telegraphed the feelings and the nature of the relationship between John, George, and Ringo versus Billy. There was a current underneath the surface, underneath the veneer, that is telling us all was not good and that the band was breaking down. The Beatles were in their demise. So what I'm going to do now is to move to slide six and I'm going to show you a slide that I presented in my presentation going back a few months ago, Is Peter Jackson Revising Beatle History? And on this slide, we're going to get quotes from both John and George about how they really felt about the Get Back Sessions. The title of the slide, What George and John Said About the Sessions. The cold and austere conditions at Twickenham, along with nearly constant filming and sessions starting much earlier than the Beatles' preferred schedule, constrained creativity and exacerbated tensions within the group. The sessions were later described by Harrison as, quote, the low of all time, and by Lennon as, quote, hell, the most miserable sessions on earth. So it's important to baseline the true history. And it's more important that these comments come from the band members themselves. So here you have it. Here's how George and John felt about the Get Back sessions. And now let me move to the next slide, and we're going to talk a little bit about recording dates. Many people believe that the rooftop concert was the last day of the Get Back sessions, when in fact it was not. Recording continued the next day on January 31st. Songs with recording activity after January 31st would be Let It Be, where the lead guitar was added in April of 1970. I Me Mine, the entire song, was recorded in January of 1970, one year after the Get Back Sessions. For You, Blue, George recorded a new lead vocal in January of 1970. So, again, a year after the Get Back Sessions, George went back into the studio and redid his lead vocal. And then in April of 1970, Ringo came into the studio to overdub the drums on Long and Winding Road. And of course, after January 31st, we would have mixing, mastering, acetates, and final pressings. Now, was there a potential for additional song edits and overdubs beyond January 31st? And the answer is yes, 
but if it's undocumented, then it is obviously unknown. And that's going to lead into another slide I'm going to show you in a moment. The official narrative tells us that the rooftop songs that ended up on the Let It Be album are Dig a Pony, I've Got a Feeling, One After 909, and Get Back. However, there is a conflict in recording dates between Wikipedia and the Beatles Bible. Wikipedia tells us that Get Back was recorded on January 27th and 28th, which means it was not the version from the rooftop session. But the Beatles Bible tells us the recording was on January 30th, which would have been the rooftop scene. Now, in episode one and episode two, we don't hear anything about Phil Spector. So I'm assuming Phil will come up in episode three. Phil was invited by John Lennon and George Harrison to take on the task of turning the Beatles' abandoned Let It Be recording sessions into a usable album. This quote came out of Wikipedia, and it is a very interesting choice of words. Phil was brought in to turn the Beatles' abandoned Let It Be recording sessions into a usable album. What this means to me is the Beatles themselves were not impressed with what came out of the Get Back sessions. And then there was a decision to take that material and put an album together. A usable album. So again, the choice of words is very, very interesting. Let It Be the album was released on May 8th, 1970. So about a year and a half after the Get Back sessions. And despite its commercial success, according to Beatles Diary author Keith Badman, reviews were not good. And in fact, many music critics, and many fans for that matter, did not hold the Let It Be album up as one of the Beatles' better efforts. And evidently, neither did the Beatles. Now let's take a moment and talk about the song, I Me Mine. And in the documentary, we get the backstory that the sessions break, they go home for the evening, and George is watching a movie. And this movie inspires him on the spot to write I Me Mine. And so the next day, he's back in the studio. He gathers up Billy, John, and Ringo and said, Hey, I was watching this movie last night. and..." The movie inspired me to write this song, and so then we get a snippet of him playing I Me Mine. And I remember thinking to myself, this sounds like a contrived story. It just did. But in any case, the point of this slide is that I Me Mine was not recorded during the Get Back sessions. The entire song was recorded in January of 1970. And John Lennon did not play on the song. He was on holiday. There were 16 takes of the song, most lasting not longer than a minute and 30 seconds. Take 16 was the best take, and it was recorded on January 3rd of 1970. The Beatles then overdubbed electric piano, electric guitar, lead and backing vocals, a Hammond organ, and another acoustic guitar. Then Phil Spector extended the song from 1 minute 34 seconds to 2 minutes and 25 seconds by repeating the line all through the day I Me Mine from the first verse and following it with a further repeat of the chorus and final verse. So George wrote a song that was a minute 34 seconds. And it was Phil Spector, through editing, who tacked on an additional minute to the song. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because the official narrative is telling us that activity took place beyond January 31st. And this is going to take us into my next chart. 
Okay, so what would one of my presentations be like if I didn't stir the pot and cause some controversy? Now, as many of you know, when I have discussed the Get Back documentary and the Let It Be sessions, I have said that this setup to record in the studio where everybody is playing together with all of these active mics was going to create bleed through. And it was going to seriously compromise the quality of the recordings. As an example, here's Billy's vocal microphone. Now his vocal mic playing through this PA, and in my next slide we'll talk about this a little bit, is going to pick up not only his voice, obviously, but it's going to pick up his bass. It's going to pick up Ringo playing. It's going to pick up Billy Preston playing. It's going to pick up John and George's guitar playing going through the amps. And it's going to pick up their vocals. So in other words, there is a very high probability of seriously compromising the quality of the recording. So I question this. And even with the rooftop scene, if you read the official narrative, it says that it was cold and windy during the rooftop concert. Now, if you're trying to get a clean recording, wind is not your friend. Even if you have the baffling on the microphones, it's still going to create a problem. Now, of course, people are going to say, but Mike, they've done live recordings before with other bands. What would make this different? And my argument would be that the live recordings that we hear, especially going back into the 1960s and 1970s, if you listen to a lot of those live recordings, the sound quality isn't great. But when recording a live performance, the sound engineers would ensure that they are using the proper equipment, the proper microphones, to ensure that they get the highest quality recording that they can get. And honestly, I don't see that with the rooftop performance. With a live performance, you're not going to record the vocals coming out of the PA system. The vocals would be wired directly into the soundboard. And if I flip back to slide seven for a moment and we take a look at Billy's microphone. Now, you may not be able to see it very well here, but if you look at pictures on the internet, you will see it. He has no baffling on the microphone which means on a cold, windy day, when a stiff breeze blew across the rooftop, the likelihood that his microphone would pick up that ripple from the wind is highly likely. So what I'm saying is, there's something else going on that we're not seeing. What we're seeing is not necessarily what we're getting. So as I've said before, I doubted the Beatles recorded Let It Be this way. The configuration was okay for rehearsal, but not for recording final tracks. However, the Get Back documentary and the 1970 film show the Beatles recording takes in the studio playing together. But the ability to capture the sound quality is still perplexing to me. Now, going back to a quote I showed before from Glenn Johns, who was the sound engineer for the Get Back Sessions, he says, playing live in one room is a fresh thing for the Beatles. Playing live. Glenn didn't say recording live. Now, some might say, Mike, it's just the way he worded it. You're looking into something that's not there. But the one thing I have learned by looking into this conspiracy is you look at everything. 
And one thing by itself may not mean a whole lot, but when you stitch it all together, the bigger picture starts to emerge. So the possibility of post-recording overdubs to fix tracks is a consideration. Going back to the chart I showed where there was still recording going on after January 31st. And if we go back to I Me Mine, the entire song was recorded one year after the Get Back sessions. Another example of activity taking place after the Get Back sessions, Billy erased John's bass track on the song Let It Be. And he re recorded the bass track with him playing the bass part. Then I found this quote from John Lennon, which I thought was very telling. So Lennon was asked about Phil Spector's work on Let It Be. And as many Beatle fans know, Phil has taken a bad rap for his, quote, overproduction of the album. But here's what John said in an interview with Rolling Stone titled Lennon Remembers. John said he, Phil Spector, was given the shittiest load of badly recorded shit with a lousy feeling toward it ever. And he made something out of it. He did a great job. Let me read that again. Lennon said, Spectre was given the shittiest load of badly recorded shit with a lousy feeling toward it ever. And he made something out of it. He did a great job. So the question becomes, how did Phil Spectre clean up the shittiest load of badly recorded shit? Now, I've done a lot of recording in my life, but I am not a professional sound engineer. But I have a friend who is. And so I sent him an email. I told him I was doing this review of episode two. And if he had watched the Get Back documentary, I wanted to get his thoughts. And so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's the feedback I received from my friend who is a professional sound engineer, and he has been in the business for a long time. He said that it all looks staged. The microphones were not the real studio microphones. The mics were used to feed the PA instead of the Beatles wearing headphones to hear the vocals. In the documentary, we hear George Harrison say, they did not receive Newman microphones from EMI. If they used the PA to hear the vocals, then this is a big issue. There would be too much bleed to all the other microphones from the PA. So, bleeding is definitely a big issue, especially if they did not use any headphones. And throughout Episode 1 and Episode 2, I didn't see any of the Beatles wearing headphones. And then he adds, behind the scenes, it's possible. Studio musicians were used before, in parallel, or after to record, re-record, or enhance the final recorded tracks. The vocals were redone. Also possible, combining takes, and this would have been done by Glenn Johns and George Martin. Slicing single bars of all the takes into the final version. And it was explained to me that this is standard practice in the music business. In the digital age, we would refer to it as cutting and pasting. If you listen to the final takes and mixes on the record, it's way beyond what you witness in the documentary. It is likely production of the album did not finish in January of 1970. And then he ended his email by saying, it's not called music friendship or music camaraderie. It's called the music business. And so with that, let me go to my last slide and I'll wrap up. Okay, so here's my last slide. I started putting this presentation together on December 7th and today is the 9th. So finally, 
my last chart. So, episode two, here are my thoughts and my opinions. The Get Back documentary attempts to spin a lackluster outcome into a significant achievement. We have to recall the original objective of the Get Back sessions was to have the Beatles write and record 14 new songs in less than three weeks, perform two live shows that would later be broadcast as a TV special. And what was the result? Well, the result was 12 songs on the album, and we'll talk about the 12 songs in a moment. And they ended up not doing a live show in front of an audience, but performed on a rooftop to no audience, and then ended up releasing a grainy, uninspired movie. So let's break down the songs on the Let It Be album. Two of the songs were throwaways, Maggie May and Dig It. Another two songs, were not recorded during the Get Back sessions. They were I Me Mine and Across the Universe. And that leaves us with eight original songs from the sessions spanning 30 days. Let It Be, Get Back, For You Blue, I've Got a Feeling, Two of Us, Dig a Pony, One After 909, which I consider pure filler track, and The Long and Winding Road, which is Billy's version of Bridge Over Troubled Water. So overall, my personal opinion is most of the songs were subpar based on Beatles standards. Most of the songs, in particular, Dig a Pony, I've Got a Feeling, Don't Let Me Down, and Two of Us, appear to be partially written or mostly written coming into the sessions versus the no backlog or writing from scratch narrative that the Get Back documentary tries to sell us on. As I mentioned earlier in his presentation, Billy Preston was instrumental during the sessions. Without his contribution, it's possible the entire project might have been shelved. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Let It Be Naked, which was released back in 2003. It was initiated by Billy. Let It Be Naked consists largely of newly mixed versions of the Let It Be tracks, while omitting the excerpts of incidental studio chatter and most of Phil Spector's embellishments. It also omits two tracks from the 1970 release, Dig It and Maggie May, the two songs that I said were throwaways. And Billy replaced those two songs with Don't Let Me Down. And why Phil Spector did not include Don't Let Me Down on the original Let It Be album, I don't know. But what he did do was to release Don't Let Me Down as the B-side of the Get Back single back in the day. So, I'm going to leave you with this question because inquiring minds want to know. Were the songs really recorded, quote, live in the studio? Or was it all scripted and just another illusion? Comment section is open. You guys let me know what you think. Have a great day, and thanks for listening.